Welcome to Arduino the Next Generation. I'm your presenter, Glenn Popeil, KW5GP. I'm a network engineer and technology consultant for HTC Global Services here in Memphis, Tennessee. I was first licensed as a ham in 1973, and I've got over 45 years in the computer, networking, and electronics field. I started out with Jet Engine Remote at Data Acquisition, Control, and Telemetry Systems for the SR71, F14, F15, F16, and others. I'm also the author of AWRL's Arduino for Ham Radio book series, along with some QST articles and product reviews. My latest book, More Arduino for Ham Radio, is now available from AWRL. The book includes another group of completely new and unique ham radio related projects. Some of these projects are actually multiple projects within a project, meaning that there's a lot of new Arduino projects that you can build. Now we're going to set the Wayback Machine to 1988. I wrote a magazine article back then that predicted the future of computer technology. That article was entitled, How Far Are We From How? It was a discussion of HAL, the computer in Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey, the computer technology of 1988, and what technological advances would need to take place to create a computer similar to HAL. That article outlined the advancements that would be needed in processing power, speech, voice recognition, and vision technologies. It also covered the advances that would be required in storage. Remember, in 1988, PC memory and disk storage was extremely limited and was very expensive as compared to today. A 1 meg memory module cost about $550 and a 30 meg disk drive cost $450 in 1988 dollars. We're talking megabytes here, not the gigabytes and terabytes of today. The article even predicted solid state disk technology and the demise of magnetic tape. All in all, mainly as a result of some very lucky guesswork and my lucky magic eight ball, the article proved to be quite prophetic. In fact, today's lowly Arduino Uno can and is doing a lot of the things predicted in that article today, and it's doing it with very inexpensive components. We don't think twice about using technology such as Alexa, the Ring Doorbell, and other advanced everyday technologies that the article hinted at. For reference, the control data supercomputers used by NASA during the Apollo missions had a 60-bit CPU running at 10 MHz with 982K of RAM. In many respects, the UNO is equally as powerful as those multi-million dollar room-filling monsters, and it uses far less power than the 30 kilowatts that each of those supercomputers used. I also often spoke of the computer world eventually unifying under a single programming environment that would work with whatever hardware vendor you chose. While we're not quite there, and we probably never will be there 100%, the Arduino does come very close to proving that one language to rule them all idea to be reasonably accurate as well. So now let's dig out that trusty old magic 8-ball that I used to write that article dust it off, shake it up, and see what it can tell us next. Um, did you know that I heard that the fluid they use inside these things does become kind of volatile after a certain age, so it might not be a really good idea to shake this thing up right now. So it sounds like it's time for an upgrade. Did you know that it's actually fairly easy to open up a Magic 8 Ball and remove all of the insides? The key component is a 20-sided die inside a liquid-filled cylinder. The fluid is actually not much more than isopropyl alcohol and blue dye, so it cleans out easily. So why don't we mount a Nano with a 128 by 32 pixel organic LED inside the clear cylinder? We'll customize a sketch that was based on the Instructable website's Magic 8 Ball with an Attitude project, and we loaded that onto the Nano. Now, before we rattle this new genie's cage, let's take a moment and look back where we've come. The Arduino has come a long way since its introduction in 2005. There are now all manner of Arduinos and Arduino variants, in addition to the original Arduino Uno and Nano that I have traditionally used to build some really cool projects. 
Most of these new microcontrollers are supported in the Arduino IDE and are every bit as easy to program and use as the original Uno. The Arduino Uno and Nano both use the ATmega328 chip, which gives us an 8-bit 16 MHz CPU, 32K of flash memory, 2K of RAM, and 1K of EEPROM. You've got 14 digital I.O. pins, and six of those are capable of pulse width modulation. There are six analog input pins on the Uno and eight on the Nano, and they go to a 10-bit analog to digital converter. These analog pins can also be used for digital I.O. The boards are powered by 7 to 20 volts DC and they have an onboard regulator, or you can use the onboard USB port. They both also have an SPI and an I2C bus on the board. Recently, several cool new boards came along that should be included in this discussion. The dime-sized Arduino Pico, that's not to be confused with the Raspberry Pi Pico, and the quarter-sized Mini Uno also use the ATmega328, but as you can see, they have much smaller footprints. The Mini Mega uses the ATmega2560 that's also used in the Arduino Mega2560, but it's in a package that's about three-quarters the size of a standard Uno. But now it's time for us to take a giant leap. You've always heard me say that when it comes to the Arduino that you're only limited by your imagination. I still feel that nothing can be more true than that simple statement. For my first three Arduino books, I focus primarily on the Uno and Nano, mainly because of their low cost, simplicity, and ease of use. But there's one thing you don't know and that I would not talk about. I was on a quest. I've been constantly looking for the perfect next level Arduino processor board. To create more advanced projects, I knew that I'd need more CPU horsepower and memory than the Uno and Nano could provide. I needed more I.O., a higher resolution onboard A to D, more flash memory, more RAM, essentially more everything, and it had to be inexpensive. In other words, I seek the grail. During my quest, I'd found Arduino-compatible boards that came close to what I was looking for, but were not quite it. The STM32 family that includes the blue pill is inexpensive, fast, integrates into the Arduino IDE, and meets much of the criteria, but the various versions of the board may or may not come with the Arduino bootloader pre-installed and they use a slightly different sketch upload procedure, so you might have to go through extra steps to bring it fully into the Arduino IDE environment. The ESP32 and 8266 are also close, and they come with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and some other features, and they too are inexpensive, but they still just miss triggering my Grail detector, which of course is Arduino powered. The STM32 is a family of 32-bit microcontrollers from ST Microelectronics, and they're based on the ARM Cortex M series of CPUs. The Blue Pill version has a 72 MHz ARM Cortex M3 processor, 64K of flash, 20K of static RAM, 32 digital I.O. pins, and 12 of those can do the pulse width modulation. You've got 14 analog input pins, 3 serial UART ports, two SPI buses, two I2C buses, and this board costs about $3. But depending on where you get it, the board may or may not have the Arduino bootloader pre-installed, and this will require a few extra steps to be al allow it to be used with the Arduino IDE. The Expressive ESP32 microcontroller series is an updated version of the ESP8266, and it offers Wi-Fi along with Bluetooth and Bluetooth BLE. You've got the Tensilica 32-bit CPU that you can get from 160 to 240 megahertz. It's got 4 to 16 mega flash memory, 38 to 77 I.O. pins, up to 18 12-bit analog to digital inputs. You've got two 8-bit digital to analog outputs, 10 capacitive touch switch sensors, four SPI channels, two I2C channels, three serial UARTs, and up to eight channels of infrared remote control and 16 channels of the PWM uh, modulation can be tied to the pins. You've got an integrated on-chip Hall effect sensor 
and this board runs on 3.3 volts and it costs about three dollars this is a good option especially with the integrated Bluetooth and Wi-Fi I probably have some ESP32 projects in a future book I also looked at several other potential candidates early on the 80 megahertz 32-bit microchip UC32 was a contender but at over fifty dollars it still remains too expensive to want to work with the Teensy series of Arduinos comes very close with the Teensy 4.1 having a 600 megahertz 32-bit ARM Cortex M7 processor 8 mega flash 1 mega of RAM and 4k of EEPROM the 4.1 also has 55 digital I.O. pins, 18 analog input pins, a selectable A to D resolution of 10 or 12 bits, and a ton of other features. The Teensy 4.1 is so close to what I was seeking that there will most likely be several Teensy projects in one of my future books. But at $32, the Teensy is still a bit on the expensive side. So the quest continued, but I did begin to lose faith. About a year or so ago, I was approached by ARRL to write a book on ham radio related Python projects using a specific new microcontroller board. I declined at the time, as I felt there was more left for me to do with the Arduino, and Python based microcontrollers really didn't interest me. So I continued moving forward, working with the Uno and Nano, while still hoping to find the Grail. And then one day, in one of my various news feeds, I received something that offered up a fresh clue to finding the grail, but it used Python. Still, it did warrant further investigation. On the hardware side, this new microcontroller did fit the bill. It has a dual core 133 MHz ARM Cortex M0 Plus processor with 2 MB of flash, 256K of RAM, 26 digital I.O. pins, and three 12-bit analog input pins. It also has two SPI buses, two I2C buses, two serial UARTs, and 16s of its digital pins can do pulse width modulation. It even has eight user programmable PIO state machines so that you can create your own custom hardware peripheral support. And adding more icing to this cake, it also has an on-chip real-time clock and temperature sensor and its onboard Python, MicroPython, supports two simultaneous processing threads, meaning it can run two separate programs at the same time. But I did not want to do Python, and the darn thing ran Python. Or did it? At this point, I was still not convinced I had found the grail. I did not want to learn Python. I did not care that the board cost a mere $4 if it meant that I would have to learn Python. End of story. I'm not interested. Next newsfeed, please. But further research into this new microcontroller caused me to take a second look at Python. To this point, my impression of Python had been that it was a scripting language for PCs. Nah, I'm still not interested. But it turns out that that initial impression was not quite correct. Further investigation revealed that Python on microcontrollers is becoming more and more like the basic programming language back of the 80s. Simple, easy to learn, easy to use. But doggone it, it was still Python and it didn't integrate into the Arduino IDE. So we'd all have to relearn everything we knew. This cannot be the grail. The search continues. Let's cue the next news feed, please. A later news feed detailed the operation of this microcontroller and revealed that it had features that allowed the user to change the programming language from the official MicroPython distribution to other languages such as SparkFun CircuitPython and a C, C++ compiler. This boot image could be changed with a simple press of the boot select button on the board. But still, there was no Arduino support. This is not the grail we're looking for. Let's clap those coconuts and ride on. But the final part piece of the message did finally get through loud and clear. Earl Philhauer has created an unofficial translation of the Arduino ecosystem to the UF2 bootloader image that this new microcontroller uses and it's available for free on GitHub. This was followed by the announcement of an official Arduino bootload image for the new microcontroller.
This means that this little $4 board now meets all of the conditions to be my holy grail of the Arduino world. But this new microcontroller comes from the most unlikely source. Could we have all been looking in the wrong place this entire time? Let me introduce you to the Raspberry Pi Pico. Yeah, what manner of sorcery is this? Wait, it's a Pi? Well, no, not quite. It's the Raspberry Pi Pico based on the RP2040 microcontroller family from, yeah, Raspberry Pi. Let's take a closer look. It could still be a fake. This can't be the real grail, can it? Did someone spike our punch? This thing has a dual core, 133 megahertz ARM Cortex M0 Plus. It's got 2 mega flash memory, 256K of RAM, 26 digital I.O. pins, and 16 of them can do pulse width modulation. It's got three 12-bit A to D analog inputs, two SPI buses, two I2C buses, two serial UARTs, and it even has USB host capability, eight PIO programmable state machines, and it also has an accurate on-chip real-time clock and temperature sensor. And it costs a mere four dollars, and it's available readily in spite of the current chip shortage. In my opinion, this does have to be the grail. It has all the horsepower, memory, I.O., and a ton of other features to build some really nice Arduino projects. With the Arduino bootloader image, it can seamlessly integrate into the Arduino ecosystem. Most of the existing Arduino modules and libraries are directly supported. For me, personally, this is the low-cost microcontroller that I've been looking for to take my Arduino projects to the next level. And yet, it retains the ease and simplicity of the Arduino development environment. So this quest has finally reached a happy ending. The future of Arduino projects for me looks very bright, for now. But uh, does anybody know what those dark clouds off in the distance might mean? But before we get to those, there's more. Several new versions of the Raspberry Pi Pico have been released, and they're still in the $4 to $6 price range. The Raspberry Pi Pico W now includes an onboard Wi-Fi chip. The Wi-Fi chips support 802.11b, G, and N, and while the chip itself supports Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth BLE, the initial release of the Pico W will only support the 2.4 gig Wi-Fi modes. The other two versions are the Pico H and Pico WH, which are the, the Pico and the Pico W with the header pins and the three pin debug connector pre-installed. But there's other vendors also creating boards based on the Pico's RP2040 processor. The WEACT RP2040 board is a Pico style board with 16 mega flash instead of the Pico standard 2 meg, and it's $8 from AliExpress. The RP2040 Zero board is based on the RP2040 processor as well, but with a smaller footprint and fewer I.O. pins, and it's $6 from AliExpress. But there's even more. The LilyGo T-Pico C3 has both the Raspberry Pi Pico RP2040 and an ESP32 C3 on a single board, and it also has an onboard 125 by 240 pixel 1.14 inch color display. The ESP32 C3 is a single core 32-bit 160 MHz CPU with 400K of static RAM. 384K of flash, and it's got 22 programmable I.O. pins, it also has onboard Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and it has an onboard JST connector for external battery power. Switching between the Pico and ESP32 is done simply by turning the USB-C programming cable over. An onboard LED will light green or blue to indicate which processor is active, and this is $13 from Banggood.com. The LilyGo T-Display RP2040 is a 2040 board with an onboard 125 by 240 pixel display, and it also includes an onboard JST connector for external battery power, and it's $13 from Banggood. And finally, the RP2040 development board has an onboard 70 by 40 pixel 0.42 inch LCD display, and it also features a QWICC I2C connector so you can tie in the external devices. And it's $12 from Banggood. 
So as you can see, already there is an ever-broadening list of choices for the Pi Pico type boards. And let's just do one more. The Pi Moroni Tufty 2040 has a built-in 2.4 inch color display and it's designed to be a color LCD badge. It also has five push-button switches and a JST connector for power. It runs on three AAA or a LiPo battery. It costs $28, but right now the shipping cost from the UK is still a little bit high. The Pimeroni Badger 2040 uses an e-ink display, and it's $16.50, but again, the shipping cost from the UK is still just a bit high. So where does this leave me? I'm currently working on a Best of Arduino for Ham Radio book that's due to be turned into ARRL in December. This book will include the best projects from all three previous Arduino projects. Let me know if you've got a favorite project that you'd like to see in it by sending me an email or letting me know the questions and comments after this presentation. The projects will be upgraded with modern components such as color displays, new text-to-speech modules, and a lot more. And we'll also add a whole bunch of new features to each of the projects. Now, remember those dark clouds we talked about? Naturally, we have to have a cliffhanger if we're going to leave room for a sequel. Everyone knows that real quests for knowledge are never-ending, and it's true in this instance as well. Again, as with any quest, this journey has changed and enlightened me. Part of the reason I'm a ham, work with microcontrollers, write the books, present these fun forums, and enjoy all the other wonderful aspects of the amateur radio community is the personal challenge to research, discover, and continue to learn new and exciting things. This quest has indeed changed me. For lack of better words, I have strayed too far into the light while on this quest. My eyes have been opened to new and wonderfully exciting things, and I can't unsee what I have seen. I can't unlearn what I have learned, and I really don't want to. So nothing ever stays the same. In the world of ham radio, kit and project building, electronics and technology in general, nothing ever stays the same. Things are constantly changing. So here we are. Standing on the edge of the future, looking at that magic eight ball again. Do we stay here, safe and secure, in the Arduino world? Or do we continue forward, walking on that razor's edge into the unknown? So let's shake that thing again and see what it says. Yeah, we do have to love the magic eight ball, and there's a reason for this. It lets us have the best of both worlds. As I have said, everything is constantly changing around us. This is also true in the microcontroller world. We'll always have the Arduino, but it seems the microcontroller world is moving towards Python-based microcontrollers. And why not? Python has been called the basic of the new millennium. It's easy to learn and use. A cool thing about Python is that you can run it both interpretively and compiled. This drastically speeds up the creative process and can potentially save tons of time while you wait for programs to compile and upload only to realize you made a mistake and have to recompile and upload it again and again and again. So is this the end of the Arduino? Absolutely not. But it does say that we have more options than ever in regards to our microcontroller projects. Microcontrollers such as the Raspberry Pi Pico are just the leading edge of a whole new generation of microcontrollers. The multiple programming language capability of the Pico adds even more choices to our microcontroller arsenal. Now you can design and build with a single hardware platform and then choose what programming language is best for the platform at hand, for the project at hand. But for me, the thought of using Python on the Pico is indeed very seductive. The Raspberry Pi Pico was designed around MicroPython, and with the ability to switch to a new programming environment later on down the road, it gives us a very flexible and long-lived development environment. The Arduino world is just now beginning to embrace real-time, multi-threaded, multitasking applications with tools such as FreeRTOS, which is the free real-time operating system. Then Python, though, is inherently multi-threaded, and in the case of the Pico, you can natively run two separate programs simultaneously, one in each core. Which leads me to say, yet again, there are no limits. When it comes to the world of microcontrollers, you're only limited by your imagination. As long as it doesn't violate the laws of physics, 
And yeah, if it does appear to violate the laws of physics, maybe you just need a bigger hammer, more voltage, or, you know, other things. But it truly is very, very versatile. Now, in my case, have I chosen wisely? ARRL and I have plans for at least two more books beyond the Best of Arduino book. Both are focusing on the Raspberry Pi Pico. The first book will use the Pico and possibly a few other microcontrollers, but it's still going to use the Arduino programming language, IDE, and ecosystem. The second book will be focused on using the Raspberry Pi Pico and the Python programming language. And there are even more books in the works, but I'm really not at liberty to talk about those just yet. You see, uh, we're still negotiating the price for my soul. And uh, does anybody know if there's a Kelly Blue Book that I can borrow for that? But for you, your journey is just beginning. You are builders, thinkers, creators, and inventors. You're a perfect match for the microcontroller world. Imagine the projects that you can build with the Arduino and other microcontrollers, and then go make them happen. And now, we'll move on to the questions and answers portion of this presentation. Thank you. Okay, that was very good. I, I like the part about the uh, Kelly Blue Book for your soul. <laughs> uh, I think you might still be muted, Glenn. There we go. Yeah, and it really does feel that way with as many books and as popular as the microcontroller topics are becoming these days. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I, I don't have enough hours in the day. And uh, okay. so, uh, uh, well, first of all, uh, right at the beginning of the presentation, Eric asked, and I had this question too uh, when we started or when I, you know, I first heard about these things. Can you explain the basic difference between an Arduino? and a Raspberry Pi, especially now that that one board has everything on it. Right. Uh, the Arduino is a microcontroller. Think of this as like the uh, control, the engine control computer in your car. It takes inputs and provides outputs, but it's at a very low hardware level. It doesn't have high computational power. And um, so... It's really just a small little device that controls things and senses things. The Raspberry Pi is a very small Linux microcomputer, like a PC. Think of, think of taking a PC running Linux and shrinking it down in size, and that's a Raspberry Pi, and it runs all of the standard Linux applications that will fit in its memory. So that's really the difference is the Arduino is a microcontroller, and the Pi is really a microcomputer. Very good. Have you ever tried to integrate an Arduino into a, uh, to use with a LoRa board? And if you have, how easy is that? Yeah, it's actually much easier than that. Um, Adafruit has a LoRa line. LoRa is a long, uh, long range uh, uh, RF board. It works in the industry and scientific uh, medical band, the ISM band. So it's an unlicensed band. Um, I use the Adafruit. Uh, feather boards that have LoRa built in. So they integrate right into the Arduino IDE, and I've used several of those in projects in my second book. Okay. Have you done anything with the Propeller CPU? No. Uh, the Propeller is um, just uh, another microcontroller board that doesn't fit into the Arduino ecosystem, um, but uh, it has its own little following. But uh, I found that the Arduino is just so much easier to work with. Okay. Are you aware of any uh, code available that can duplicate an analog meter on a small color display, such as the TFT? Um, I have seen that. Uh, I would uh, just do a Google search for that, and I'm sure that you can find a template to work with these TFTs to give you that analog meter. I've seen it all over the Internet. Okay. Uh, it's or have <laughs> yeah, let me try that again. Is there a PowerPoint of this presentation available for somebody to download? I know it's going to be on, uh, it'll be here for 30 days, and eventually it will make it to uh, Eric's uh, Vimeo site at some point. But uh, have you got anything? Um, no. Um, I, will be glad, I will be glad to share the PowerPoint. I would be glad to do a presentation for your club with it. Um, you know, this is all open source, so you're more than welcome to a copy of this. 
uh, just send me an email at kw5gp and I will get you a, a Google Drive link for it. Uh, but I do recommend that you just work with me and uh, have me do a presentation. That way it's a whole lot more fun for everybody. Yeah. And of course, uh, your uh, email is good on QR, is it? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Uh, is there an Arduino or a Pi with a DA converter in it? Uh, actually, yes. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. I had it in this presentation. I think it's the STM32 has a uh, onboard D2A, and there is also an SPI bus uh, D2A converter, and I've used this or mentioned this in one of my books. I believe it was my first book, but it might have been my second book as well, and I cover that, but it's a single-chip D2A converter that uh, interfaces directly with the SPI bus so you can use it with any member of the family. Yeah. Do you know uh, anything about the Raspberry Pi availability? Uh, Raspberry mm -hmm. Pi availability. I know they're still uh, sometimes unobtainium, and even yeah. used ones are going for quite a bit. Unlike the uh, oh yeah, the Arduinos, which are still easy to get. Yeah, I'm glad you tackled the availability word than I did. <laughs> um, the uh, Raspberry Pi. I just don't have a whole lot uh, doing with it at this point. I'm heading in that gener general direction for some other projects. Uh, but yeah, I've heard the Pi is in very short supply. But on the flip side, uh, the Pico, uh, I was actually at the Collinsville, Illinois Ham Fest in January of this year. And Joe Eisenberg uh, from CQ Magazine and I went over to St. Louis just across the river. And in the micro center right there, I bought two of the Pi Picos right off the shelf. And here recently, I bought some from AliExpress.com, and they're readily available. So they're relatively easy to find on the Pico side right now. All right, it's good. Okay, this is, uh, the, real quick, uh, the person that was asking about a uh, the uh, analog to TFT meter, uh, we have someone saying it's on GitHub. So that is there. I'm going to put this question up on the screen because it's kind of uh, yes. long. Uh, I have a DRA818 volt powered by, or V, powered by the Nano ATM Mega 328 3.3 volt port. When I upload a new sketch, the USB resets and the upload fails. The power draw is too much. Do you have any idea for a solution? Um. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the DRA818V, uh, but the Nano um, 328 uh, 3.3 volt port only sources, I think it's like 100 milliamps. It's not a very powerful supply. Uh, there is a chip similar to the 70, uh, 7805 voltage regulator that is for 3.3 volts, and I would recommend using that uh, to supply your 3.3 volts and just sharing the common ground with the Arduino and you won't have any any conflict between the two if you power some devices by that 3.3 and others by the Arduino on board 3.3. Although at that point, you could just use the external and you'd be fine. Okay. Here's another one. And I love these because they're so technical. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I have a 10 Tech Patriot that is Arduino Uno based, he mm -hmm. thinks, and would like to use it for FT8. So, uh, need to add the code for USB on 40 meters. Are you familiar with anyone who has written code for the Patriot that might have something that would work? Um, actually, this is interesting. Uh, we actually did this with the Rebel for JT65, and that's covered in my second book. Um, we uh, recruited uh, Joe Large, W6CQZ, who wrote JT65HF. And what we did is we set it up so that the uh, Arduino uh, would send tokens to the, uh, and it's actually the, uh, the microchip uh, UC32 or UNO32, uh, it's an 85 megahertz version of the Arduino in the uh, the Patriot. And uh, we had it doing JT65. And that software was unfortunately written in uh, Pascal. And uh, that code is still around. I actually uh, sold my, uh, my Rebel and uh, gave the, the individual all of the code. But I think I've got copies that are here. But it's in Turbo Pascal. But... Um, at this point, I don't know of anybody that has done it with FT8, but there is FT8 code out on the internet. Uh, 
that there is being used in the um, the uh, balloon uh, telemetry systems that are based on the Arduino. So you might want to start there and um, see if you can find something. Or if you can't, I'll be glad to send you this code, but you need to find somebody that knows the Turbo Pascal. Okay. Um, to learn Python, did have you learned Python? Or have you got to the board where you can get around the Python? Because if you did do it, uh, did you go to a website or a book to learn how to do that? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, Elector has some Python books and I picked up a couple of those. I'm still in the beginner phase with Python. Uh, it's a very easy language to learn, but right now my brain is still in the Arduino C, C++ mode to finish up this particular book's projects. And then I anticipate sometime around Christmas uh, shifting gears and jumping into the Python, but I've skimmed Python and I've also used the website and there's realistically, there's no reason not to use the internet or both. Uh, I generally start with the internet cause that's usually free and just go from there and find out where my gaps are. Yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't have to be a one or the other approach. You can certainly do both. Now here's an interesting one. Um, Somebody is saying, I've used uh, some of the Learn Arduino programming, you know, commercial kits, and he finds that it's mostly plug and play. He was wondering if you have a recommendation for learning the Arduino language, which it's great if you want to do it, but uh, I, I guess one of the draws of the Arduino is it is plug and play. You don't have to learn that. But if you really wanted to get down deep into it, where would you go for that? Well, here's the real simple solution, and it's free. Um, Arduino.cc has a boatload of tutorials on their site. And then also SparkFun and Adafruit have a pile of free tutorials on their website. And I would go there and find out, you know, if there's pieces missing or you, you think there's areas of knowledge you, you need to get deeper, then I'd start Googling and, and see if you can't find something there. But generally, Arduino.cc and uh, Adafruit and SparkFun are the, the first places I would look. Good. Okay. And when we were talking, since you brought up Adafruit, uh, speaking of them and their integration with Arduino, do you know if the feather boards integrate, uh, especially for projects that may require accelerometers? Oh, absolutely. Um, Things like accelerometers, just use digital I.O. pins. The libraries for the Arduino work with the, uh, the uh, Adafruit um, feather boards because they're all part of the Arduino IDE. And it, it's back to that premise of one language to rule them all. Just change the different hardware and the IDE will recompile it for the uh, feather board. So it's, it's very interchangeable. Very good. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have any questions for Glenn? Well, huh? not seeing any. <laughs> Anything? I, I, think we, I think we either put them to sleep or, you know, they're, they're still trying to absorb it all because it was, uh, as you saw, it was kind of like uh, Mr. Toad's wild ride at Disney World with that one. Um, <laughs> you know, just bouncing from one direction to the other. And that was really a peek inside my mind as I was searching uh, for a next level chip, because a lot of my projects are heading that way. And uh, the Uno and Nano just don't have the horsepower for where I'm, I want to go. Okay. It's a great start though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, this was just so much fun to, to, to start researching and everything. And the more I dug, the, the more, interesting that it got and uh, I, I never ever thought that I would end up looking uh, at something like the Raspberry Pi Pico Pico yeah okay all right well once again uh, it, and I've uh, chatted with Glenn several times he's very accessible his uh, email address and QRZ is a great way to get a hold of him and uh, very exciting and looking forward to the new books coming out yeah, and there's another question here. Um, uh, in addition to the praise, thank you guys. I, I enjoy doing these presentations. It's just a lot of fun. But uh, Josh Ham Tactical uh, talks about my second Arduino book with the, uh, the feather boards in it. 
Uh, that one is, I believe, titled uh, More Arduino Projects for Amateur Radio. Uh, there's some confusion in the titles. The best way to put it is this is the white covered book with the easy button <laughs> in the upper left hand corner. Uh, and that was, that was just some really wonderful uh, cover artwork from uh, ARRL. And uh, just really, really, I've loved the cover artwork that they have done. And, uh, but that will be the, the, the white covered book with the easy button. Now, that book is out of print. Uh, your best bet would be to go on eBay, but be prepared to pay a price because apparently, even though they're out of print, uh, these books are still in very high demand. You can come to the local library in Horn Lake. They have a set of my books. That they, they, they say those books do not stay on the shelf. And this is just a local Mississippi library, yeah. uh, which is just absolutely fabulous. But uh, yeah, and this was the reasoning behind why we came back with the best of uh, Arduino series, because there are so many projects in those first three books. And the third book is still in print, but it's, it's heading towards going out of print. And so uh, talking with Dave Minster at ARRL uh, earlier this year, and we thought uh, bringing back these projects in a best of uh, compilation would be the best way to, to get those projects that people want back in their hands and they'd be updated and modernized to use the current IDE and things of that nature. Very good. And... Uh, you know, every everybody here. Thank you for the, you know, thanking for the presentation and enjoying it. This one was especially fun for me. It was started with the premise of the next generation, and naturally, it fell into the Star Trek: The Next Generation, and then it just kind of developed this movie quote theme going through it, and I just going down that kept going down that rabbit hole. And everything just kept fitting and fitting. And I'm like, this is just so much fun. I had so much fun putting this one together. Well, you had said that it would uh, it was sort of like a little sight inside your mind. And I figured, oh, that's scary. But you're you're among friends and like-minded people here, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't see anybody with a butterfly net coming after me. Um, yeah. And David W0DF uh, about... Uh, something new coming out before my book gets printed. Yeah, they do change very fast, but the, this is the thing I like about the 2040 uh, and the Pico is that it's very flexible with that boot select button. Uh, you can switch from Python to I Arduino to whatever, and it will keep up. So it's just a really nice hardware platform. That's flexible uh, on the, uh, you know, on, on that single platform. So I wouldn't be worried about the RP2040 getting outdated anytime soon. Yeah. CW is going to be outdated sometime soon too. So. Yeah. Well, you know, I was reading something the other week that was saying that uh, CW is really making a huge resurgence even now, more so yeah. than it had been in the past few years. Yeah. So, uh, and now Scott is asking about any insight on using the microcontroller to build a cloud sensor. Uh, this is where we head into this uh, programming language called Node Red, and uh, it will run on a Raspberry Pi, but it will also integrate with a huge number of sensors, and uh, the, it has cloud-based control, and uh, it also will integrate an Arduino. So I would recommend looking into the Node Red at NodeRed.com, N-O-D-E-R-E-D.com. And they've got a lot of stuff, including some great tutorials there. And that's where I would start my cloud computing and, and start from there, because that's really where I'm, I'm I'm heading into. And Scott, yeah, the Monty Python thing, it just it just kept rolling and rolling and rolling. And if you read back through there, you'll also find some unintended uh, references into the, the point where I said, and I just couldn't find it. And that scene with the Knights of Knee just popped right up, and I never followed up on that. Yeah, you know, but that's the one word I shouldn't be saying. Yes. So yes. It's Sir Robin. Um, <laughs> yes. And so I mean, but you know, when you start doing a PowerPoint presentation in that frame of mind, the creativity just flows, and it all just weaves itself together. And he's no for detecting clouds in the sky. Oh, okay. Um, 
that would be probably your best bet would be like a, uh, a photo resistor and let it detect the dimming of the, the sun uh, clouds blocking the sun. Uh, kind of like the way they do the detection for uh, planets circling stars far away, the way that the planet blocks the solar light coming from that star. Uh, you could do something similar with clouds in the sky with a uh, photoresistor. That's what I was thinking, too. But uh, when you were talking about cloud computing, I said, oh, yeah, well, boy, did I misread yeah. that. Bob. Yeah, I misread it, too. <laughs> yeah. I'm all into the cloud right now with the Node Red stuff. I have been researching uh -huh. Node Red very heavy here uh, recently, and uh, it has really been a lot of fun looking at the control and capability. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Scott, um, I'm not sure what you're referring about the Peltier uh, device. I actually have, uh, believe that's that's in my second or my third book. I have a Peltier cooler controller, and uh, that's that's one of the, that's just really a cool chip. I'm not sure you could build a cloud detector with it so much, but uh, I do like the heating and cooling capability that you can do with the uh, the Peltier devices. And and thank you, Gregory. Like I say, I always have fun doing these, and this one I just kind of went off the rails and took it off the deep end a little bit. And uh, I'm, I'm happy y'all enjoyed it because th this I just had so much fun putting this one together. And I, you know, part of it was I really didn't want to do any kind of reveal until I really got towards the end. So I was kind of misdirecting and feeding a whole kind of different um, approaches, you know, like, am I dumping the Arduino or not? You know, which, what's happening? Where's it going? And it's, at this point, I honestly, I'm not sure I know because, you know, the, the Pico to me has given the Arduino that kick up with a $4 chip. And uh, even though you've got the Teensy and, and these others at $4 for a dual 133 megahertz chip, that's just phenomenal. And I really see me standardizing on that particular platform. Yeah, at that price, it's difficult not to. Yeah. I mean, you can I, blow I them up and who cares, you know, buy five of them at a time. Yeah. Yes. And that, that was the thing. And once I bought the two that I got directly, you know, they're the official Pi versions. Uh, I then uh, got on AliExpress and that's when I found all those other variants are coming out. And I'm just like, good grief, this thing has taken on a new life all of its own in terms of uh, expansion and horsepower. The one with the onboard 1.14-inch uh, LCD is really, uh, just really, you know, impressed the heck out of me. I can think of all kinds of cool things I can do with that. Okay. Another question. Have you ever looked into the propeller board by Parallax? No, I haven't. That's one of those that... Uh, I just chose to focus on the Arduino. There are so many other boards out there. You know, the original basic stamp, the Arduino was created to replace it because of cost. And I just have had no interest in going to the propeller board because the Arduino is so cheap and versatile and everybody's board integrated into the Arduino IDE. So I kind of just chose to stay inside that world and, and never looked outside of it. Okay. Only so many computing languages you want to take on at a time. Yeah. So. And, and that's why I chose the, the uh, IDE, the Arduino IDE, because mm -hmm. it's so standard. You know, you just check the box on the hardware and poof, you're on a different platform. Yeah. And that to me was, you know, just that versatility and flexibility. And, you know, my brain can only handle one language at a time. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of where I go. But, yeah. uh, yeah, you know, I'm I'm really looking forward to playing with the Pico, and I don't know where it's going to take me with the Python, um, and the Node Red, of course, ties into all of this, um, and that's going to lead me back to the Raspberry Pi itself. And uh, Tom is asking, did I get the DigiKey Microcontroller Compendium? No, I did not. Uh, I generally, uh, I I mainly stick to my search in the Arduino area and. You know, watch the new projects coming out along that line and just 
various things that hit my news feed. And that's really how I found out about the Pico was uh, AWRL approached me to write a book with it in Python. And I'm like, that's just not my cup of tea. And the more I dug into it, the more I realized, yeah, it is my cup of tea. <laughs> and and then when they came out with that Arduino IDE, I'm like, there it is. Yeah. Uh, Glenn, you, you had just mentioned something about your news feed. Uh, where is there, well, I'm sure there are sources everywhere, but is there like a main source or a better source where you get your information on projects for the Arduino? Um the main source that I use is a very archaic system, and it's actually kind of scary. It starts with the words, wouldn't it be cool if? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then they just come out of this mush up here that you know doubles as a brain sometimes. And it's literally, I just sit and I look at something and I'm like, you know, wouldn't it be cool if this could do that? Like I looked at that MFJ beacon monitor and I said, that's an atomic clock. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, when I got it, I thought, oh, it would listen on the air and tell me what stations it heard. So I'd know which direction the bands were open. And then I started looking at, it. I'm like, you know, if I replace these individual red LEDs with an RGB LED and gave it a receiver and give it some horsepower and tuned it to the, the, the beacon networks on the various bands, I could decode the beacons and then I would know who I'm hearing. And then I could light the LEDs accordingly. And then I could look at it and say, oh, there's where the band is open and it's open at low power or high power. And then follow that with, gee, wouldn't it be cool if we could do that? Yeah. Uh, we have a couple things. I'm going to put one up on the, uh, the screen and this is for building a cloud sensor and I'll read it real quick, but I'll, I'll leave it there so people can see it again. It's at uh, the website www.farnham, which is F-A-R-N, as in Nancy, H-A-M, hyphen A-S dot C-O dot U-K forward slash 2013 forward slash 04 forward slash building hyphen A hyphen cloud hyphen sensor. So the person who wanted to take a look at that, uh, I'll leave that up there for a little bit. And uh, another question is, what do you think about the low-cost SDR radio projects that are coming out? Well, and that's really the cool thing is SDRs are the hot thing right now. And uh, I just love them. I love the waterfall displays that everybody's building with those. And this was one of the reasons why I wanted to look at some more horsepower like the, the Pi Pico is if I, if I kind of jump into that platform and for lack of a better word, because I don't, I don't really try to, to tout myself as the leader of this pack. Uh, it's a community effort. But if I go there, people will go there because they've already got projects there that I'm creating and that others are creating. And then everybody, you know, it's kind of like everybody getting into the pool. And so then you start getting more of the low cost SDR projects coming out and people will branch out. And so that's, you know, really where I'm at, I believe that the Pico was going to be the good platform to build a nice little SDR radio out of. Mainly because it's got more horsepower. Yeah, the dual cores and the memory, I think yeah. it's going to be really nice. Good. Okay. Um, yeah. Come on, y'all. Clap, clap up some more questions here. This is fun. <laughs> I, I love the Q&A because, it, you know, you guys kick some off, kick off some ideas in my brain. Wouldn't and, it be uh, nice if? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I need to patent that. Wouldn't it be cool if? Yeah. Days. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just that's literally where my brain starts out is I'll look around and I'll say, you know, wouldn't it be cool if I could do this? And that was the same thing with the uh, the Fox Hunt triangulation system. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, wouldn't it be cool if I could just take two or three triangulation readings and use calculations and have it give me a GPS coordinates of where to walk to to find the fox? Yeah. Which, once again, we'll bring up is not legal for ARRL sanctioned foxes. <laughs> Correct. But it sure is fun to, you know, mess with your friends and family. Yeah. Uh, any idea how the Pi Pico compares to the Teensy 4.1 for doing SDR? Um, not for doing SDR, but in terms of raw horsepower, uh, the Pi Pico has about 26 IO pins and it's dual uh, 133 megahertz CPU. 
The Teensy 4.1 is a 600 megahertz 54 pin beast with a lot of memory. Uh, the difference in price is $4 for the Pico, $5 for the Pico versus $35 for the Teensy or thereabouts. Um, and that's really the only difference. If you're going to do an SDR, then yeah, the Teensy would probably be the better choice, but would it also be overkill? And I always, at this stage of the game, I'm into versatility and low cost. And so I would try to do it on a, a Pico first. And then if I needed the horsepower, I'd move up to the 4.1. Okay. Thanks, Craig, for that question. Yeah. And that's one of the things that this Pico opened up to me was SDR style projects and, you know, scanning a band and just, you know, much faster, more versatile, multi-threaded type programs. Not that I'm any good writing them, but it you know, gives, me <laughs> nice, gives me nice stuff to dream about. Oh, okay. Um the hardware support for floating point in TNC important is the hardware support for a floating point in TNC important. Um, I think that's the question. Uh, well, it, you know, it's, it's going to be the same uh, floating point library. So that's, uh, I'm not sure if the TNC actually has a hardware support for floating point. If it does, yes, that will be a big factor because doing floating stuff, floating point stuff in software is CPU intensive. So if it does, and I haven't researched the Teensy that heavy, all I looked at was the 600 meg and boatloads of memory and said, this will be cool down the road. Hmm. But uh, yeah, if it's got the onboard hardware floating point, that's definitely uh, a, an advantage in its favor, particularly with SDR and those, uh, what do they call them? The fast foyer uh, calculations. Now you're going to make me go look up the Teensy. Yeah. <laughs> I memorize all this stuff and then immediately gets covered up with something new. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So Greg's saying, yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. In that case, the Teensy is going to be your better SDR radio, just in terms of horsepower and speed. All right. Getting near the top of the hour. So if other people want to get to the next presentation now's probably the time to click over but glenn has earlier said that uh, he enjoys this if you have more questions please ask them yeah we'll stay as long as you have questions <laughs> within reason <laughs> but i think we're, we're winding down to the the end of the questions okay well i've got a question that off the top of my mind but <laughs> What is Fire the airspeed away. velocity of an unladen sparrow? <laughs> <laughs> oh. I actually have a t-shirt with that formula on it. Somebody knew me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. African or European? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you have to know these things as a king. <laughs> yeah. That's just, that is, you know, that, that is just absolutely one of my all-time favorites. Yep. And, you know, the killer rabbit, you know, just doesn't get any better than that. And, um, uh, the, yeah, and again, when you when you're doing these kind of presentations, that stuff is running around in in the back of your mind. Yeah, Scott, you're already trying. I'm just gonna say, <laughs> African or European? Yeah, you know, and you know, is it two carrying it between their legs? And uh, John, please ask away. Ask your technical question away. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm not quite dead yet. That's yeah. yeah. That's very true. But yes, John, please ask a te technical question. That's what we're here for. You know, we're having fun too, just to fill the time. But yeah, I think I'm supposed to be answering technical questions. You know, as dry and as boring as that is compared to the other <laughs> subjects we have at hand. But uh, yeah, and that that's why I say I've really enjoyed putting this presentation together because it's amazing how all of these little references resonate with everybody mm. you know across the board you know they they've heard these movies they've seen them and now you've got this just off the wall um, okay can you use a thunderbolt to ethernet adapter uh on the arduino um no because the arduino doesn't have thunderbolt support um 
So you're really not going to be able to go there. Thunderbolt is more of a PC level thing. So the, the adapters and stuff for the PC don't work. And the big reason there is the USB library. USB is a really intense protocol in terms of discovering the device type and loading a driver and things of that nature. And you just don't have that flexibility and power in an Arduino to do that arbitration and calculations. So no, uh, you, you do have a standalone ethernet adapter that you can integrate into the Arduino. It uses the SPI bus and I've used it uh, in several projects. But um, as far as a Thunderbolt to Ethernet, no, I don't don't know of any that will work. Yeah, and Scott, if you're going to go to a new presentation, you know, it's time to <laughs> run away now. Yeah, run away, run away. Run away. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but if anybody's got any more questions, you know, type away. Otherwise, we'll, we'll end the feed here in a minute or two. But see, Don, even you got to learn something today. Yes, I did. Well, not only that, but uh, I feel like I was participating in a different uh, podcast that I shall not name, even though they were here on the uh, QRZ Expo, and I bought something <laughs> earlier. I uh, went out and I researched the uh, phase dock, so now oh. I've got something to uh, not spill things all over the place. Um or have the little boards move while you're trying to hook wires into them. Yeah, I think you're going to be really happy with that. Yes. And, and uh, uh, for anybody else, uh, the phase dock is basically, a, well, I'll say it because it's on their website, a Lego type thing that you can plug these little things in and then you can move your uh, Arduino and other things around so that they don't skid all over the uh, the desk or you don't have to worry about them afterwards. And, phasedoc.com p-h-a-s-e-d-o-c-k and i also say that it's kind of like uh breadboard on steroids mm -hmm. and you know because you can have these various modules and just move them around or swap them in and out you're using an uno here no i want to use a pico pop the uno board out and click in the pico and bang you're you're ready to keep prototyping and building yep but it looks like the questions have faded off. They probably run off to their next presentation. Yep. <laughs> so I'll uh, they, turn it back left, over to you. I'll, uh, one more reference in the same way. They've left like rats out of an aqueduct. So oh, you know that there one. You go. <laughs> A different Money Python movie. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, once again, thank you. And uh, once again, if anybody has any questions, Glenn's very reachable uh, by his uh, email address and QRZ. And since that does seem to be all the questions, we'll just say thank you for everybody joining in. Thank you, Glenn. And look forward to the books and have a good night. Thank you. Okay.